two, move, 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 move. This is how I'd sound if I was an MMA fighter, but here I am again doing my final expense routine here. My name is Dave Du Ford, owner of Final Expense Agent Mentor at FEAgentMentor.com. Thank you so much for joining me today on another edition of the No BS Final Expense Sales Training live stream. Coming to you on Facebook and replayed at all times on Facebook as well as on YouTube. I hope you guys had a fantastic Thanksgiving week. I know I did, ate Thanksgiving twice in fact. Uh, one with the in-laws and one with my family as well. But now that that holiday has passed, I am back live on Facebook to help you out with all of your final expense sales training questions and uh, concerns. And as usual, what I'm going to do in today's session is go over a particular training topic to help you get better at selling final expense. I hope what I bring to the table gets you results that you can put into action immediately because that is the title of my stream, live stream, No BS. I want stuff and training for my agents and people who are just watching this video that actually works. Nothing that's fluffy or made up and untested. All I care about is getting results and so should you. So today's particular training topic is about rapport building, trust building, and properly introducing yourself to your final expense prospect. This is part one of four training modules that I'm going to be doing on each live successful or successive live stream training coming up over the next month. So um, all of this corresponds with my four-part sales training or sales presentation training that I train my agents on how to do. So the first part is the essentially the opening or the beginning part of the training session and or I'm sorry the, the beginning part of the presentation and what you want to do in every sales presentation of course is optimize your chances of success so that if the person across the table from you indeed is a prospect who is qualified and has the ability to buy that you get their business that same day that is your goal on every single sales presentation and appointment that you go on and so every sales process has a system attached to it uh, anywhere that you go work or any profession that you do or any product that you sell uh, the guys at the top of the food chain the top producers the people who have done it successfully not just for a short period of time but for an ongoing period of time have all done so because they have a system in which they follow and in final expense it's no different here I teach a system that gets results that's easy to follow once you implement it and uh, basically just commit to doing it. So the first part of that system is really the beginning parts of introducing yourself as a person, as a salesperson to the prospect, but also creating a connection with them, so-called rapport building and trust building. So let's go ahead and get started right away on how to do that and how to accomplish that. So first thing to talk about is rapport building. So what exactly is rapport? Rapport building essentially is the idea of creating some like-minded connection between yourself and your prospect. Now rapport building doesn't necessarily mean you've got to like uh, get to know them intimately more so than anybody else. It means you've got to create some kind of mutually respectful connection. You don't have to be best friends either. You just need to kind of have, you know, a connection. Something more than a stranger, but maybe less than a close friend. Somewhere in between. They're pretty broad uh, estimation there. We'll go into detail about that momentarily um, as to how to do that best and what I think the best way to accomplish that is. Um, the other thing you want to do in the beginning of a sales presentation, selling final expense, is also build trust. Now, I'll get to that later as well. But trust building is really the glue that binds everything together. We sit down with our prospects and really ultimately sell ourselves more so than the products that we sell. If you're a final expense agent, and you know as well as I do that most of the people you sell to never question the actual product that you're selling. They just take what you recommend them and sign up for it. The reason is, is because they trust you. And that's super powerful, especially once you understand how to establish that trust because it it's because they're sold on you. 
So we'll talk about that more in depth in a moment. And lastly, we're going to do a step-by-step -step scripting of how to properly introduce yourself. This is really important because the whole introduction part of this uh, presentation is positioning yourself as somebody who's worth listening to, that's going to provide value for your prospect, and so that they know in their own mind who you are, what you do, and why it matters to them. So you have to script this particular section relative to the rapport and trust building, which is more intangible and subjective to an extent, whereas the introduction is objective. You just got to be scripted with it. You got to know how to deliver it in the right tonality, right verbiage, in order to get the maximal input out of it. So uh, how you doing today, Gleason? Hope you're doing fine. Thanks for liking. Hey, Brenda, how you doing? So let's talk first about rapport. So what do you do when you... Like when somebody talks about rapport, how do you establish rapport in an effective way? Very, very simple strategy I'm going to teach you that I learned when I was uh, sitting in on a conference with a pretty large agency that this was like the only thing I got out of it and it was worth the whole thing because it, it took the rapport idea in a big picture and then really laser focused it into a few core things you can do to get really good results in rapport building. So. In order to effectively rapport building, your goal, and this is what they taught me at the conference, your goal should just be to get them to basically laugh. Now think about that for a minute. If you can get a stranger that you just met a little while ago to laugh, what does that mean? It means that they're comfortable enough to at least open up a little bit and expose themselves in a form of, hey, thinking that you're funny and um, you know what you have to say is kind of interesting. It's, it's enough to create the beginnings of a connection, enough to create the beginnings of rapport with the prospect. Again, visually, if you can think about somebody who's a prospect, you see me on your screen. If you see somebody that's sitting like this, lean back with their hands crossed, what does that indicate visually? Usually that means they're skeptical. From a visual component, when your hands are crossed, it means you're reserved or conserved. It's, you're not open and necessarily even engaged or trusting the person that you're talking to. Now, juxtapose that with when somebody does open up, what do they do from a body language standpoint? They lean in, just like I'm doing now, they create eye contact with you, and, and many times they'll mirror exactly the positioning bodily that you have. So if you're leaning back and you're sitting back like this, or if you've got a leg crossed over another one like this, they'll do the same mannerisms as well. And what that means to you is that they're connected to you to some level. They're interested in what you have to say. They're very attentive to what you're there to do. And it's a good sign that you've established enough rapport with them that they will continue to go through the process, listen to you, and um, begin to be open-minded with what it is that you're going to present. So it's very powerful to pay attention to body language because any language expert will tell you what you look like, your body language, your positioning, your tonality more than the words that you say mean a lot more than the words that are actually said. So be very cognizant of that. Watch the person for that because you want to see those arms break you want to see their posture to be engaged and that's usually a good sign that they're ready to begin the next sales the next beginning of the next process other tactics that work well as, as well is just to ask them about their profession or their former profession since most people will see are retired ask them about their grandkids that's always an easy way to break the ice because most of these people we see have grandkids they really like them in most cases if they're not stealing their money or other things. <laughs> and even if they do steal their money, they usually like them. So ask them about that. They'll usually be more than happy to gush endlessly about their life, their grandkids, their favorite hobbies and that thing. Uh, now, how much rapport building is enough? That's a great question that most agents eventually ask. It's like, well, how long do I have to listen to Mildred talk to me about her life story? Do I stop after 15 minutes or is it after an hour? Again, I go back to what I said momentarily ago. The idea with rapport building, really objectively speaking, it's a subjective concept, but objectively the goal is to get them to be at ease. And you can tell that by their physical body posture. I can tell you when I started as a final expense agent about five and a half years ago, I would let people talk endlessly. I would never let them, or I never purposely jump in and stop them. 
I would literally let them talk to the extent that they were comfortable with because my concept, which does work fine, is that people that like you buy from you. That's true. It will always be the truth. But the thing is, is you don't have to have them love you. You just can, you know, establishing likability is, is, takes a lot less time than many would think. But as I've progressed in my career, especially selling face-to-face -face with pros the final expense prospects, it, it doesn't take longer than a couple of minutes, if that, to establish rapport. Because the big thing in selling final expense is not to make the prospect become your best friend. It's to convey authority and trust that you know what you're talking about and what you're delivering to your prospect, they can obviously see that it's going to benefit them, that you are, you know what you're talking about, you're sharp as a tack, and you've got the expertise and enthusiasm to sell what you're selling. All of that, again, subjective in a sense, combined together is what establishes the most important aspect of selling final expense, and that's establishing trust with your prospect. You must have trust. That is the glue that glues everything together in the prospect in the, in the process. Again, I would rather do business. Think about yourself for a second. I want to do business with somebody I trust, somebody that's competent, somebody that demonstrates their knowledge, somebody that um, is straight up with me. They may tell me something I don't want to hear, but I appreciate the fact that they're honest. Now, somebody who's wanting to be liked, like the person who thinks in an old-fashioned way about rapport, may not be necessarily trustworthy, but they may be kind of interesting or entertaining, but would you trust your money with them? To me, that's everything in this business, and I have morphed or devolved, <laughs> depending on how you look at it. I think it's a evolution of how you look at the sales process, and how you doing today, Bo? You've got to be able to establish trust, and, and the good thing is, again, it doesn't take a lot to establish trust, because with trust, as well as rapport to a certain extent, it's not something you do in like the first five minutes of the sales call. You establish this thing over the period or the course of the sales presentation. You get their guard down in a positive, mutually beneficial way, and you use the sales presentation to establish and reinforce yourself as the expert because you can demonstrate knowledge about health conditions, prescriptions. You can clearly and, and, and cognizantly describe the differences and options out there. You know what they see on TV. You know that what they see in their junk mail. And you can show them the difference on what one product does over another. That stuff, it doesn't necessarily register in the mind of the prospect. This guy's trustworthy, necessarily. But it's kind of this ethereal, intangible thing that develops better over time so that your prospect's like, wow, this guy knows what he's talking about, which really translates to this guy is somebody I want to do business with if they're actually a person who's a buyer and is predisposed to wanting what we're selling. So we've talked about rapport, the importance of at least getting their guard down, getting them to be comfortable in the right mindset to listen to what it is that you're offering to potentially help them out. We've also talked about trust building. Again, trust building is very, very important, um, really not as a one-time activity, but as a reinforcement mechanism to drive them closer to you because they sense uh, from a gut level that you know what you're doing and you, they trust you and what you, you're there to do. The third thing you have to do that's not as intangible as the rest of these is to properly introduce yourself before you really get into the thick of your sales presentation. So what exactly is an introduction? So an introduction is the ability to state who you are. This is the, the formula or the framework. It's a statement of who you are, what you do, a little bit about your background to kind of validate what you do, and a positioning statement that tells you why they should do business with them or why other people do business with them. I say why other people do business with them because, or why other people do business with you because it's a peer, third-party kind of validation method. It's not saying you got to do business with me because I said so. It's like people like you do business with me because of X, Y, and Z. So if they're that prospect and they hear the kind of things you're saying and can relate to that, then in a way it says, I'm like that too. I kind of fit the kind of person that would do business with them. So the very important strategy. So let me take you through a sample introduction statement. You can say the introduction statement, 
before the rapport building or after the rapport building. I move it back and forth. I'll even say it after I pre-qualify to a certain extent, but I always make sure to state the introduction because, in, in a scripted fashion because it's so important to get in their heads who you are and why you're there and why it matters to them because 90% of the stuff that's said in any sales presentation is always forgotten within the next 24 hours. So you want to make sure you give a scripted, solid, uh, t tonality focused introduction script. So let's go ahead and say it. So when I sit down with prospects, so let me tell you, now you told me a little bit about yourself, Mrs. Prospect. Let me tell you a little bit about who I am and what I do. My name is David Duford. I'm a licensed life insurance agent with the state of Tennessee. I have been for almost six years now. I have helped over 1,500 people get affordable final expense coverage to pay for their burial expenses. And the reason people do business with me is because everybody I see pretty much is on a fixed income. And they're looking for a way to spend the least amount of money for the most value out of their final expense plan. Bottom line is, they want to get a plan that they can properly afford to get good value out of, but they don't want to spend too much money for it. What I do that's different from a lot of agents is that I actually represent a variety of companies, in some cases 10 to 15, and I ask my customers like yourself what their health is, and then I go to these companies and see which one of these is going to give you the best option. Long story short, I give you the best bang for your buck so you don't have to spend any more than you have to on a final expense plan. That's the script in a nutshell. I basically say about 80 to 90 percent of that every single time I sit down with a prospect. So let's go through each portion of this. The beginning's obvious. You state who you are. My name is David Duford. What you are or what your designation is, I'm a licensed life insurance agent with the state of Tennessee. Also, just as a, as a segue or an additional, it's very beneficial if you laminate your license and hand this to them as you're saying that. Again, it's not enough anymore just to tell. You also have to show, okay? You can't assume that your prospect is going to take everything you say as gospel truth. In fact, you should think that they completely are skeptical of every claim that you make, including your claim that you're licensed. That's a claim. We assume that we know it's true because we've sat the license. We know we got the license, but we always have to try to validate what is the truth by showing evidence. And if you think like that, by the way, throughout your entire presentation, you are going to sell more just by that mentality that you take nothing for granted. So, as I said, my name is Dave Duford. I'm a licensed life insurance agent. That's me handing my license over with the state of Tennessee. I've been in business for five and a half years. I've helped over 1,500 families get final expense coverage to pay for their burial costs. The reason people do, and so that's the validation, that's third party uh, validation, where I say I've helped this many people for X number of years do this. So if you're brand new to the business, you don't worry about it. One thing I used to say when I got started was, I'm licensed by the state of Tennessee, I've been licensed for under a year, I've jumped through all the hoops to be able to be licensed as a life insurance agent. I pass all the tests, I've done all the studying, that kind of stuff still is a statement of proof or credibility, again, which will, is, in as many cases, is good enough anyway. You don't have to have a thousand people to have anybody regard you as an expert or not. You just have to make some sort of claim and then back it up to some extent. So the last part is the most important. This is the unique selling proposition. The reason people do business with me is because most people I see are on a fixed income and only have so much a month that they can afford. And many companies only sell one company or only one product. The way that I'm different and the way that I can help people like yourself out is I go out with the 5, 10, whatever amount of companies you have and I shop around to try to find the best price and the best coverage. And so the goal is for you and my clients is I can in many cases get them better quality coverage at a much better price than what they'd find on TV or through the mail or through another agent. So that whole script there, if you're an independent agent, and that's what I'm assuming, you probably you may be not, and you may have to alter that. But if you're an independent agent, by the way, I hope you are, because that's the best way to be successful in this business. If you're an independent agent and you open up the script like that, 
you're positioning who you are, and if you think about what the prospect is listening to, if there's somebody that in the back of their mind has been thinking about buying burial insurance for a long time, when they hear you talk about, I deal with, or I deal with people who are on fixed incomes, I deal with people who don't have all the money in the world, and I deal with people who, you know, uh, are looking for the best value of coverage. These people who are buyers are thinking about that. They're like, I don't know if I got the money. I don't know if this is really right for me. I don't want a two-year waiting period. I heard that Colonial Pen has me uh, has two-year waiting period policy. I don't want that. This is all the objections swirling in the back of their head that have yet to be verbalized yet. And so what happens is when you say that positioning statement and you make sure to hit all those potential objections, it's a powerful statement of benefit to the client so they know who you are, what you do, and just like I said, why it matters to the prospect. And once you make that statement, the way you know you're doing it right is the person's like, yeah, oh yeah, that's me, I'm on a fixed income. And they kind of are following you along verbally or, or via body language that they agree with your statement. So that's me, because I, I personally I hear that all the time. And you will too when you start saying this. It's like, yeah, that's me, I'm on disability, I make a thousand bucks a month. I don't have a money tree out back. You know, and they'll say stuff like that, or yeah, I've got health problems, and uh, blah, blah, blah. I, yeah, I, I've seen that thing. So, you know, that kind of stuff makes a huge impact on getting connected with them, which is funny because those statements of benefit connect the client like rapport building does, or like trust, trust building, because it really is rapport building and trust building. And that's kind of like where, in a sense, where I want to start to conclude this particular training. At the end of the day, if, if there's one part of the sales presentation of final expense that's somewhat intangible, it's the beginning, with the exception of the introduction. And the key thing with rapport and trust building is that it's not a, or not a part of the whole as much as that it is a part of the whole, meaning that the rapport building and trust building is always either increasing or rapidly decreasing because you said something that turned them off or you start saying things that build that level of trust and rapport up. So the key factor here that I would suggest to somebody as a personal producing agent like myself has been for a long time is just try to focus in the beginning to get your client at ease, really get good at scripting out your introductory statement, and remember the true trust building and rapport building is built when you demonstrate your knowledge on their health, their medication history, being sensitive to the concerns that they have like budget and quality of coverage and really building the case as to why they should do business with you versus all the other options that are out there. So what I'm going to do now is go ahead and check, check my uh, Facebook page out here, see if anybody's had any particular comments or questions. I want to thank you guys so much for attending uh, this week's uh, training session. <clears throat> so just give me a second while I pull this up on my screen here. Um, let's see, just like the book says, uh, yes, that's right, I am the author, by the way. How you doing today, Tony? A lot of what I say um, probably came out very similar to what the book says because um, a lot of the book itself was verbally dictated in. Um, nice way, I talk better than I write, and if you haven't noticed on this uh, quite long video, <laughs> I can talk a lot about something for a very long time, which is useful when you're trying to write some sort of book that um, encapsulates the training that I'm teaching now. By the way, that book is the official guide to selling final expense insurance. If you're interested, you can go to my website, feagentmentor.com, or you can go to Amazon and put in final expense book. You'll see it there. If you like it, buy it. Um, if you're in this business, you're brand new, it's very useful and uh, I think helpful. Uh, let's see here. Thank you, Nathan. Hope you're doing well today. Appreciate your kind words, sir. A fellow Tennessean, I think, right? And Richard says, I find that treating them like human beings instead of target seals the deal. Building trust, like you're saying. Great stuff. Absolutely. more. Uh, Richard, yeah. I totally agree with you. The funny thing about sales, um, let me get a sip of my coffee here. I'm on my third or fourth large <laughs> cup today. Can't go without it. One thing I'll say kind of is just some commentary. You know, I've always thought, I had this problem when I first started in sales, is that Hollywood, just like it glorifies 
and personifies the extremities of life or culture. It does the same thing with sales. If you guys can think of Boiler Room, or you can think of even Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. If you haven't watched these, these are really good videos to watch. Uh, good, good, great movies to watch. Those are the first two that come to mind. I, I've not seen Wolf of Wall Street, but um, that guy is crazy as well. But if you think of Glenn Gary and you think of the salespeople in there and how much, how, how, how much of schmucks they were, how they manipulated and lied with their pitch, um, and, and even the boiler room approach, Hollywood personifies salespeople as schmucks, as, as snakes in the grass, as people that are only interested in themselves and not enhancing the livelihoods or the values of their customers. And when you get into sales, and that, that kind of personification of sales makes this profession look bad. And just like any industry, any profession, there's bad salespeople for sure that fit that mold perfectly. Of course, that's what Hollywood wants to talk about. They don't want to talk about the guy who is uh, passionate about helping his clients and will do what it takes to help them improve their lives. You know, I don't know how much sex appeal and how many movie tickets you could sell talking about the um, life insurance evangelist that uh, gets a death benefit paid for a surviving widow. You know, I don't know if there's much interest in that in, 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 a, in a movie, but the, hopefully you get the idea of what I'm saying is that the, the real reality of sales, if you could just boil it down, is that you're making a human connection with somebody that needs help. And if they can be helped, you help them. You get them a plan that solves a problem they already have before you arrived. If you can't help them, you leave and you go to the next one. You go to the next sales call. I just got off a sales conversation or one of our agency conference calls with a guy that writes 20000 a month in business through my agency. His name is Wade. He's out of Kentucky. Um, it's exactly what he said. He says, we walk into these sales presentations and we think and have the mindset that we're going to help these people, but we have this mindset that our goal is to, to do no harm either. And, and if by helping them means that we don't actually sell anything, then so be it. Because the reality is if you believe and you follow the system of selling final expense and you're dialed into a marketing system that pr predictably brings you lead generation and people to see, you know you're going to see somebody eventually that is in dire need of what you're selling. So you don't need to cut corners. You don't need to be um, a high pressure idiot and try to sell this stuff and, and just be uh, high pressure. It's unnecessary. And the truth is, you'll end up losing a ton of that business because Mildred will just wake up the next morning and say, what the hell did I just do? I'm just going to drop this thing. You know? So that's what happens. So, you know, you never see that side of that of this business either, by the way. And many times you only see the top producers and all the money they're making, how great it is. But you never see the lapse rates, the persistency rates being poor because of how much crap they hawk to people who didn't need it. And so, very important, good point to make. If you just take the mindset of being a servant and being an evangelist for life insurance and helping when it is necessary, the money will follow. You'll do well. You'll help a lot of people where other people will not help. And I promise, when you get your first death claim, as all agents will relate, that's when you realize how much impact you have on people's life and how much you can help them. That's definitely the case. So moving on here, um, let's talk. Uh, let's see. Uh, Brenda, how you doing today, Brenda? I'm a little intimidated about going to a stranger's door and knocking. Do you ever call them first? Good question. Okay, so I'm assuming that when you say this, that you have um, a lead in hand. So you may be cold. If you want to jump in and make a comment to clarify, feel free to. If you're cold calling, let me know. I'm going to start by explaining what do you do with a lead in hand and then um, what you can do uh, if you've got uh, a cold call scenario because there are two different important uh, scenarios here. So if you've got a lead, here's the mindset you have to have when you're prospecting your leads. The mindset you must have is that they solicited you. This is so important to understand. They are soliciting you when they send that card in. Now, what do I mean by that? When I say they're soliciting you, 
first of all, these people that you're seeing that send a card in or request something over the phone, I promise you, they get these solicitations every single week, if not every other week. They've actually sent multiple cards in throughout their entire career. I know, or entire, their entire life, I know because five and a half years, I see people I sold five years ago, okay? The fact is, the bottom line is, is that they're soliciting you, and so at the end of the day, you have to think like that, that they're the ones requesting the information. You're just doing your job delivering the information they requested. And, you know, if they get mad at you, it's because they're jerks. And they'd be jerks to anybody, whether it was yourself or somebody else. You can certainly call over the phone. That definitely works. It takes some skill set to develop. And it's a little different than getting in front. But you're going to get the most opportunity out of setting appointments over the, or I'm sorry, seeing people in person with the lead card in hand. You're going to get more appointments than the guy who sets appointments, generally speaking. Um, so, uh, okay. Yes, okay. Hopefully that answered your question, Brenda. So, um, and if you've got any other clarifications of that, I'll be happy to uh, uh, comment in the, in the box if you've got any other uh, additional questions. That. So I'm going to end this video now because my wife rolled up with the twins. Momentarily, they're going to be walking up the stairs screaming like crazy. And this uh, video will get very, well, maybe entertaining even more so, or at all. <laughs> I don't know, but it's over now. So thank you so much for attending uh, this week's No BS Final Expense Sales Training Session. I will be back next Friday at 12. We're going to talk about point two in the conversation, which is the pre-qualifying and fact-finding part of the presentation. This is the most important part of the sales training process, this part two that's coming up on Friday. I advise you to attend this one. I promise you this is the part of the presentation that agents don't do well enough that if they spend time focusing on, they'll elevate their levels of success and get better results. My name is Dave Duford. I'm the owner of Final Expense Agent Mentor at feagentmentor.com. Guys, have a great weekend. Thanks.